Chippy the parakeet never saw it coming. One second, he was peacefully perched in his cage singing. The next, he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. His problem began when his owner decided to clean his cage with a vacuum cleaner. She stuck the nozzle in to suck up the seeds and the feathers in the bottom of the cage. Then the phone rang. Instinctively, she turned to pick it up. She barely said hello when Chippy got sucked in. (laughs) She gasped, let the phone drop, and snapped off the vacuum cleaner. When her heart, with her heart in her mouth, she unzipped the bag. There was Chippy, alive but stunned, covered with heavy black dust. She grabbed him and rushed him to the bathroom, to the bathtub, and turned on the faucet full blast and held Chippy under the blast of the ice cold water, power washing him clean. She did what any compassionate pet owner would do. She snatched up the hairdryer, blasted the wet, shivering small bird with hot air. The last line said, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. (laughs) Ever feel like you've been, um, been sucked in, washed up? and blown over. Someone once said, um, Humpty Dumpty didn't fall. He was pushed. Uh, We kind of feel sometimes like Humpty Dumpty. We feel like um, we've fallen off the wall, but we didn't fall. We actually were pushed off the wall. And uh, often, even as believers, we long for that Camelot, for that utopia, for that that place where life is going to be good and fun and rich. Uh, There's a character in history, Diogenes is his name, he really was a character in the 5th century B.C. He was part of the school of cynics, and um, they said that he lived much of his life in a large tub, large glass container. And the story goes that Alexander the Great came by to see him one day, and Alexander the Great said to him, is there anything that I can do for you? And he said, yes, you can get out of my light. (laughs) He was that kind of a cynic, critical, sour all of his life. But when he was about to die, he had instructed his disciples to bury him uh, with his head face down. And the reason he asked them to do that was because he said at some point, one of these days, the world is going to be turned right side up. Things are going to be made right. And I think a lot of us live our lives like that, thinking, just waiting for life to turn right side up, for things to be good. And the reality is, is that there is no perfect life. Life at best for many people, including believers, is tough. God never meant for it to be easy. If it did, we'd have people coming to Christ in groves, right? And because of that, because of the difficulty and the trials of our lives, we often feel trapped. In fact, often we feel as if we're locked in as a person, that we can't get out. The prison walls of, for many uh, who are in incarceration, are not made of brick or mortar or bars. Some of the, the the prisons that people live in are are greater imprisonments than those who are actually behind bars. It, it, it may not have occurred to you, but all of us really, in, in some, to some degree, 
function in and out of prison. For some, we are prisoners of other people's expectations. We, we live much of our lives as a virtual slave to another person or people's expectations. Uh, for others, it may be a prisoner of personal insecurities. You really want to reach out, you really want to touch people, you want to touch them for Christ. But there's somehow this kind of a uh, layer of ice over the deep waters of our souls that keeps the love, the, our affection from coming out. Some are prisoners of personal habits, bad or sinful. Uh, the author of Hebrews called this the besetting sin because it's the one that knocks you off your feet often. It just keeps coming back. Some are prisoners of, of loneliness. Even though they may have people around them, they, they constantly feel this sense of being alienated. Uh, there was a book written a number of years ago. I think it's a great title. I never got a chance to read the whole book. But it, the title was Crowded Pews and Lonely People. That's often true in the church today. There are crowded pews, but people who are still very lonely. Some live in prisons of gossip and misrepresentation where information that isn't true is going down the grapevine. Some live behind the prison bars of guilt and shame where, where, where you're unable to touch people for Christ because you are plagued continuously with this sense of guilt and shame. Emotions such as fear, anxiety, worry, anger, and even bitterness keep people locked behind emotional bars, psychological bars. So much so that they recoil in depression, discouragement. And there's some who just constantly live as a prisoner to their own emotions, not just not one or two, but all of them. And their whole, their whole Christian life is based upon how they feel instead of what God's Word says. Some are, are imprisoned in a relationship, such as a marriage, in which one may feel there will, that the relationship will never get any better. Some are imprisoned with physical ailments, pain, and other things. That, that in, in some cases, ailments that will never go away. I know some of you deal with that. I know also there are others here who other people don't know, deal with a lot of pain. Some are perhaps prisoner, uh, prisoners of things that, per, that God will never deliver them from. And so if one is to be great in God's eyes, one has to be able to cope with prison experiences. And the prisons, again, are not those made of bars. We as believers, as we look at the stepping stones to greatness and we talk about becoming great in God's eyes, we cannot become a casualty of a prison experience. Uh, when Debbie and I moved to Southern California, we, we were acquainted, went to a place you perhaps have heard of called Disneyland. And then we moved to Riverside and we had a, a guy, and a couple who came to our church and he was the piano player for... Disneyland, uh, the, 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 you know, the uh, Dixieland piano player on, on Main Street. And so they were always giving us tickets to go to Disneyland. And I said, uh, at one point I said, uh, I, I've been to Disneyland so much I feel like my middle name is Mickey. I'm tired of it. I was so glad when our kids kind of grew out of that. Um, but one of the, the exhibits or rides that I particularly liked, and especially, um, was one that's called the Pirates of the Caribbean. You've been there? You've been through that? Yeah. And it's got, the, of course, you get in this boat, and you're going through this, these, whatever it is, river, whatever, and you see all these uh, animated figures who basically are portraying the debauchery of the pirates. 
But my favorite scene in that ride or exhibit, whatever it is, uh, is a scene that you come to right before you go out. Jerry, there he is. And you got these guys behind the, the bars, and you got the dog that's right beyond their reach. And what does the dog have in its mouth? The keys. That's right, the keys. Well, if we are living in prison experiences, and we are to be great for God, then we have to discover what are the what are the keys for dealing with prison experiences? What do we need to know to cope with prison experiences? As I said, many times we are, we're functioning in and out of prison experiences. So what are the keys? Well, the Apostle Paul, no doubt, was in prison. He, he was at the end of his life, um, and he's writing Timothy, no doubt. He's talking to Timothy about what he is to become in terms of stepping stones to greatness, the things that he's supposed to do, as we talked about last week, the baton that he is to take and to move forward as it relates to the kingdom. Now, at this last section of 2 Timothy, what does Paul do? Paul turns the attention back on himself. And he basically shows us the keys to dealing with prison experiences. And today, that's what we want to look at. What are the keys of dealing with prison experiences? And the first one is found right in in uh, verse 9 of chapter 4. Again, this is a great section. I love this section, and and, and I tell you, you couldn't finish the book better uh, if Hollywood had written it. I mean, Paul does a masterful job here. He says to Timothy, make every effort to come to me soon. Now, and these are intense words here in this passage. Basically, the literal Greek is here is quickly come quickly. In other words, come. Paul was saying to Timothy, I need you to come to me as soon as you can. Drop everything you can, uh, everything you're doing, and come to me ASAP. In fact, there were those who even criticized Paul because they said, that's pretty self-centered of Paul. So they tell Timothy, who is a pastor at Ephesus, to drop everything he's doing and to come to minister to his needs. But see, they they didn't understand. Paul sits in a cold, dark dungeon, and he longs to see his friend and his son in the faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, he said, Longing to see you, even when I recall your tears, so that I might be, may be filled with joy. No doubt, he wanted Timothy to come and to comfort him. I, I, I suspect that he wanted to talk to him and to share some things that he could not put into a, a universal letter, or what we would say today, something that he couldn't put on the internet. But the overarching thing here was his his father-son love for Timothy. In fact, he began the letter by calling Timothy his son. He knows that if Timothy doesn't, doesn't come soon, he will not see Timothy again this side of glory. Not only that, Paul wanted Timothy to bring with him John Mark. You say, why? Well, look in verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. Keep in mind, John Mark was one with whom Paul had had a falling out, so to speak, earlier. He thought John Mark had become a wimp. And so basically, John Mark and Barnabas went one way and Paul went the other way. But there was a reconciliation before this letter, actually. And now he says, bring, bring John Mark with you. Now, some translations say he's useful to me for my ministry. Some translations say he's useful to me for service. The Greek in the literal translation here is, to me, to me, he is useful or ministry or service. And when you put the, something like to me at the front of a sentence, you put it in the, what we call the emphatic position. So he's saying to me, to me, I need him to come. He basically was saying, 
as you're coming, Timothy, come, and as you're coming, I want you to pick up John Mark, with, and, and you two come together, so, because I want both of you to minister to me here in this, this, this prison. I think what this underscores is the fact that Paul believed in the, the importance of the body of Christ, and Paul is showing us that we need one another in the body of Christ to exhort, to admonish, to encourage, to comfort. In fact, go with me. Hold your place here and go with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, Paul is, um, has, has written uh, the church at Corinth. We know that. Uh, he actually had written it at least three letters. Some think that he wrote four letters, and two of them are, are lost. And, you know, he was dealing with a, a, a messy group of people at Corinth. And in the process of writing these letters, he, he's waiting for Titus to come back and to bring him uh, some news. He wants to know what's, what's going on down in Corinth. And so here's what Paul wrote back to the Corinthian believers after he received good news from Titus. In ver, beginning in verse 5, it says, For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. And you get that? We were afflicted where? On every side. Conflicts without, fears within. Paul, you had fears? Sounds like it, doesn't it? Hmm. Verse 6. But God who comforts the, the depressed comforted us by the coming of Titus. Interesting how Paul put that and phrased that. He said, God who comforts the depressed. What was he intimating? He was intimating that I was struggling, he said, I was struggling with depression. I battled fear, and now it turned to depression. And God comforted me, basically, by sending me one of my spiritual sons to enter into my prison experience of depression and fear to comfort me. Again, Paul teaches how God uses human instruments to comfort us, to care for us, to encourage us, to walk beside us. Uh, that's the body of Christ. Now, what happens when we, we interact with one another and as Christians interact with one another and we say, we say, how are you doing? We say, fine, wonderful. And sometimes that's true, and that's wonderful when it is true. But as I said earlier, often we're operating in and out of prisons. And so often the fear of opening up, uh, of being vulnerable, is very real. Uh, in the Bible, the Holy Spirit doesn't say, let your per perfection be made known to all men. I know that's a, that's a translation, but the Greek there is, let your progress be made known to all men. God never said that you had to be perfect. When I recommitted my life to Christ and went off to a Christian college, I, for a long time, I kind of lived in this bondage that, that I would call just feeling that I had to be perfect. And I knew I wasn't perfect. But I felt like I had to keep this image up, this kind of facade up, and kind of keep that thing polished. I think a lot of believers live there. And the truth of the matter is that everyone isn't fine. Many of us are locked behind bars of loneliness, insecurities, uh, guilt, misunderstanding, emotional scars, financial paralysis, physical ailments, many of which have not gone away and some of which will not go away. But we're often chained to the prison ball of pride that won't let us go to another and say, hey, my life is not where it ought to be with the Lord. And I need you to come into my life and, and, and to hold me accountable and to love me and pray with me and, and support me. You know, I, I've said 
the family is, is very much like the body of Christ. That's what God calls it, the family of God. And, and I had three older brothers who were very good of, to me, kind of epitomizing the, what the body of Christ should be. There were times when they, as I told you, they would say, hey, you're getting big-headed. Get it right or we'll make it right. There are other times that when I was successful, they were right there applauding me and cheering for me and whatever I was doing. There were times when I was hurting and they would enter in and, and my, to my experience. I remember specifically when I was about 11 or 12 years of age, I contracted blood poison. It was in my face, actually. And um, I was in a hospital, in fact, in the hospital for about four days over Christmas. And that, I tell you, that's, that's a bummer when you're in the hospital, 11, 12-year-old. But my brother James, uh, I remember one a couple nights when he would come to the, that hospital room, and I had a uh, subscription to Sports Magazine, and, um, and he read page after page after page to me. And I thought, man, aren't you tired of reading? But that night it hit me. He really loves me. He really loves me. That he would do that. That's the body of Christ. One of the myths, again, in, in the church today in many corners is this expectation, often unsaid but nonetheless fleshed out, is that everything is okay, everything's got to be okay, and the slight hint of struggling with anything is a sign of carnality and a sign that we're not there yet, that we're not, we're not spiritual. I call that plastic Christianity. Things were not okay with the Apostle Paul here or in 2 Corinthians. And you see, we Christians are running an, an in run when we fail to take advantage and understand the importance of the body of Christ in our lives. And each of us needs to open his or her life to the giftedness of the body of Christ, but not just the giftedness. Sometimes there's an overemphasis on that. But to the experience and the struggles of others in the body of Christ. Look at the one another's in, 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 the, in the New Testament. The, the New Testament is replete with the one another's, love one another, accept one another, admonish one another's, another, comfort one another, bear one another's burdens. And that, that word another, one another actually, is a translation of one Greek word, which means another of the same kind. Who would be another of the same kind for each of us? Believers, right? You see, if I set my cells on a course of isolation and I go off and say that I don't need the body of Christ, then I am not going to be able to cope with prison experiences. Listen to what Chuck Swindoll said in his book, Dropping Your Guard. He says, because I now know the joy and freedom of having my guard down, I no longer feel any need to fool anybody, to play the mask game to make verbal sounds with my mouth, <laughs> I like this, to make verbal sounds with my mouth that my mind know, knows aren't true. What a great way to live. Amen. One of the problems I've, I've encountered in the body of Christ is I've heard people say to me, you don't know the people I know in the body of Christ. You wouldn't share your life with them. Well, Paul points out in verse 10, some who would, but chose not to, and then some who would, but couldn't. Look in verse 10, back in 2 Timothy chapter 4. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Now, who is Demas? Well, we don't know a lot about Demas, but we know this. We know that Demas was not a lightweight. He had been with Paul in many up and downs. He had been with Paul fighting for the kingdom. But now apparently the kitchen has, the, the heat's got too hot in the kitchen and Demas is out of dodge. I'm mixing metaphors here, but you get the point. 
Now, many read this and they, they assume that he was a heretic or had become apostate when he left Paul. Not so. He actually went to Thessalonica, where arguably the most healthy church in all of the New Testament resides. John Calvin, speaking of Demas, said, But we are not to suppose that he completely denied Christ and gave himself over again to ungodliness or the allurement of the world, but only that he cared more for his own convenience. Watch this. He cared more for his own convenience and safety than for the life of Paul. He could not stay with Paul without involving himself in many troubles and vexations and a real risk to his life. See, Paul's assessment that he, that he loved this present world was not a judgment on Demas that he had become a villain. No. Demas had done merely what all of us do at times. He had come into disgrace by a well-worn path. The pleasures of this world. We might refer to him as, as a backward Christian soldier. Uh, you see, he's still part of the ranks. He just doesn't want to be on the front line. He wants to be on the back line cheering for those who are on the front line, but he, he, you know, he's, he doesn't want to be in the battle. Interesting, the, the, the phrase, the things of this world, is really this present age. And I was reminded as I was studying this that this kind of goes along with what the parable that our Lord gave in Mark chapter 4 we talked about the parable of the sower. You remember that? And in verses 18 and 19 it says, And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. But the worries, now watch this, the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. You see, Demas has lost his ball in the weeds. He's bothered with the, the things of the world. And the reality is that he, he just wanted a mild case of Christianity. He didn't want the real disease. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, If anyone loves this world, the love of the Father is not in him. At, at, at the risk of sounding overly critical or negative, I think a lot of believers today in our country could have written across their forehead, even though they attend church every Sunday, they could have written across their forehead, Demas. They just want a mild case of Christianity, not the real disease. But then he says, Christian has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Now, Christian was probably uh, another assistant who had joined Paul at some point in the ministry, but he was now, Paul had sent him to, to do some work somewhere else. Titus, of course, was another one of his disciples, and Titus was about kingdom business at this point. But he said, only Luke is with me. Now, why is Luke with him? I don't think Luke is there to, to teach Paul. I don't, I don't, I, can you imagine Luke saying to Paul, Paul, remember, you know what you wrote, Romans 8, 28, everything's going to work out for the good. No, I think Luke was just there to come alongside of him. To say, hey, I'm here with you. I, I, I'm going to live this battle with you. Uh, someone has said that empathy is becoming a naturalized citizen of another person's world, another person's struggle. Debbie and I, when we had our first child, Josh, I, I always get this wrong, but three months, eight months, six months, somewhere right in there, Josh incurred a, 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 a benign tumor right on the curve of his arm, his armpit actually. 
and, um, and, I, and talking to the doctor, he said, what we need to do is just hope that, that we had been re re referred to the, uh, the Children's Hospital in Orange County. And uh, the specialist there said, well, we just need to hope that he grows big enough uh, so that we can delay the, uh, we can delay the surgery and, 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 and hope that the, the tumor doesn't grow to get very large. I said, well, what happens if you have to do the surgery now, soon? He said, well, we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> That's a great thing to say. And I said, well, come on, tell me what. And he said, well, I, it's never happened with us, but we've seen where it could, some surgeries where a child has, will lose the use of their arm. Debbie and I walked out of the hospital that day as a young couple, mid-20s, and, uh, and the Southern California sun was as bright as it could be. But that was one of the darkest days of our young married life. And I had to go back to the seminary that day. Uh, I don't remember, but th th there's a friend that saw me from across the campus named Isaiah Jones. Now, Isaiah Jones doesn't mean anything to you. But Isaiah was the piano player for a well-known group in the 70s called Fifth Dimension. And God got a hold of his life at Caesar's Palace and said, what are you doing here? Get your life out right. And so he came to seminary. And we became close friends. And so Isaiah runs over to me and he says, well, what's the, what, what's the results? Well, how did the doctor visit go? I said, well, it wasn't good, Isaiah. And I told him what the doctor said. And he said, oh, man. He put his arm around me. He said, man, Byron, I love you. And he said, I'm going, I'm going to walk through this with you. I'm going to be with you step by step. I want to tell you, as a young man, 25 years of age, that was huge. Isaiah had entered into my prison experience and loved me and walked with me. We all need a Luke. We all need a Luke. We'll come in like this beloved physician and help bring healing and support and encouragement to our lives. If you're not in the prison at this moment, one day there will be a prison experience in your life. And you'll need others to come into your life. And that's why we need adult Bible fellowships. That's why we have home fellowship groups. That's why we have small groups. The, the, I can't emphasize the enough, uh, enough the importance of being, uh, of being connected with other believers in your life. Uh, uh, if you're not in a home fellowship group or an adult Bible fellowship or men's or ladies' study, or you're not, uh, find somebody that you can go to and say, hey, I need you in my life, and I need to have a transparent experience of fellowship and support here. I need you to hold me accountable. So first, there was communication with God's people. Secondly, there's communication with God through His Word. Look in verse 13. It says, when you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments. Now, the cloak is, was really kind of a poncho. I call it a poncho made of a blanket. It basically was made of thick cloth, and it was that which kept people warm. And he said, come before winter. They were approaching winter, and he said, go, go get my cloak. But he also said, bring the books. Now, the word books in the literal Greek is biblios. It's the word for which we get the word what? Bible. Bible. Deb and I sometimes will say to each other, we're going out the door, get my biblios. Or have you seen my biblios? Now, in this particular case, this was probably the papyrus rolls. Might well be the, the, these rolls can contain the earliest forms of the gospel or gospels. Some speculate that these could have been early Christian documents or perhaps collections of sayings of Jesus or early versions of Christian preaching. And some even said it could very well have been uh, Paul's exegesis of the Old Testament. But then he said also, bring the parchments. What would these be? 
These were the Hebrew scriptures that were written on parchment made from animal skins. In fact, the scholar Linsky said that this well could have been a reference to bringing the Septuagint. What's the Septuagint? It was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was done about the third century before Christ. But the bottom line is that, that Paul said, listen, get the Word of God and bring it to me. And, and you ask the question, why, Paul? Who are you going to teach? Your life's about to end and there's nobody there. I don't think Paul is really interested in teaching anybody at this point, I, nor do I think he was interested in doing further exegesis of the Old Testament, Greek, uh, Hebrew Old Testament. No. I, I think he knew that the only way to be healed in his soul and to face the, what he was facing, he's about to die, was to have more of the Word of God. And that's what he was saying. Bring the Word of God to me. William Tyndale, who was um, a, a great translator, Uh, was in a prison waiting for death because he had dared to give the people the Bible in their own language. Towards the end of his life, he wrote to a friend, send me, for Jesus' sake, a warmer cap, something to patch my leggings, a woolen shirt, and above all, my Hebrew Bible. There's a touching story that's told of a French lady, young lady, who was born blind, And then she was taught to read by by Braille. And someone gave her a translation, I should say a Braille edition of the Gospel of Mark. And she kept reading that Gospel over and over to the point that her fingers became so callous that she could not feel any longer. And trying to do something about that, not realizing what she was about to do, she cut off the calluses. Well, you know what happens when you do that. They grow back and they're worse. So finally she picks up her Bible and she said, Farewell, farewell, sweet word of my Heavenly Father. And then she kissed the Braille Bible. And when she did, she realized that her lips were more sensitive than her fingers. And for the rest of her life, she read the Bible through her lips. And I wondered, do we love the Word that much that we would go to that trouble to read it? Better yet, do I love it that much? It's interesting that um, when we face a prison experience, life gets reduced to the bare essentials. Nothing can put arms around us like the Word of God. Here's a great graphic. Go ahead. The Word of God is God's love letter to us. It gives us the truth. It tells us the truth about ourselves, about reality, but it does it clothed in grace and love, just like that picture so portrays. Immanuel Kant once said, a single line in the Bible has consoled me more than any, than, more than all the books I have read besides. It's the book, it's this book, the Biblios, that restores our souls and elevates our thoughts to hope and confidence. That's why without pounding and without, you know, browbeating you, I can't emphasize enough the importance of being in this Word. So secondly is the communication with God's Word. Here's the third and by the way, we're just going to mention the last two, so don't, if you're looking at the time, don't look. Oh, man, he's not going to make it. He's, here you go. C is a consciousness of God's forgiveness. A consciousness of God's forgiveness. Listen, there's nothing that produces bitterness more than living in a prison experience. You know that? There's nothing that produces that more. 
Uh, if, it's, if it's loneliness, then it's the bitterness that says, nobody cares. Nobody cares. If it's misunderstanding, one is bitter because no one loves them. If it's an emotional scar that's been there for years, one is bitter because they say, why me? And I can't, I'm, I can't tell you how many times I've had over the years, 30 plus years in counseling where I, where I have heard people say to me, why did I have to have this background? And I'll say a number of two reasons, because we live in a sin-cursed world, and number two, because God is sovereign and God is using that to bring you to this place where, they, where He can do a work in your life to bring you to wholeness. That's why. If it's, if it's a strain and broken relationship, then the bitterness is, I'll teach him, I'll teach her. Nothing plants those seeds of bitterness like our prison experiences. The Apostle Paul had two good reasons to be bitter. First, because he was viciously opposed. Look at verses 14 and 15. I'm not going to read them, but basically what Paul was saying is, Alexander the coppersmith has hurt me in many ways and caused me endless grief. Now, we don't know who Alexander the coppersmith is. It could be that he was the one with whom Hamanaeus that Paul said he turned over to Satan. Probably not likely, however. The fact that he used the phrase, the coppersmith. Alexander, the name Alexander was as common as John is today in our culture. Probably wasn't that. But the word much harm is a word which means to display and often was used for the laying of information against another one, another person, another man, a woman. In other words, malicious gossip. And informers were and were great in, in the Roman world at this time. The word deserted here, he says, in this passage, let's, let's, fact, let's just go over and read this. Uh, in verse 15, it says, Be on guard against him yourself, for he vig- uh, vigorously opposed our teaching. At my first defense, no one supported me. Now watch this. But all deserted me. Now watch the next statement. This is, this is, wow. May it not be counted against them. Hmm. Just like Christ on the cross, right? When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's exactly what Paul said, basically, here. May it not be counted against them. I would suggest to you that that tells me that Paul didn't struggle with bitterness at this point, even though he he should. I mean, get, get in your mind. Here's the greatest Christian outside of Christ who has ever lived, and he's at the end of his life, and no one is there. No one. I mean... What would we do today? We would rent the Georgia, the Georgia Dome and we would call in all the big speakers and all the big guys and the celebrities in, in, in the body of Christ and man, we'd give them the greatest send-off you can imagine. But nobody's there with Paul. Nobody. But Luke. How could Paul do that? Because on numerous occasions he said, forgive even as Christ has forgiven you. How can he say that? Because he understood the cross. He understood the forgiveness in his own life. He understood what the the hymn writer so well put or wrote when he said, was it for crime that I have done that he groaned upon the cross? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Paul understood that. He got that. The last two in this would be a continuation. D is a continuation in God's purposes. Look in verse 17. It says, But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and that all the Gentiles might hear. What was he saying? He was saying, I have continued in the purposes of God. Regardless of my 
my experience, I have continued. Whether I'm in prison or out of prison, I've continued in God's purposes. And that's what we've been talking about throughout this series, is to continue in God's purposes, as Paul was telling Timothy. The last is the confidence in God's deliverance. In verse, the latter part of verse 17, he says, But I was rescued out of, out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. It's, this is exactly what I said on Easter Sunday. Paul did not see, in this case, Paul did not see death as a threat. He said, God's going to del- deliver me either through this or out of this. Doesn't matter. He will deliver. So what are the keys for facing a prison experience? Number one, communication with God's people. Number two, communication with God's with God through the Word. Three, a consciousness of God's forgiveness. Four, a con- continuation in God's purposes. And five, confidence in God's deliverance. If you see a hamster, a hamster will see his freedom outside its cage. He's in a glass cage. And so what will he do? He will get on his wheel. He's running for freedom. He wants to get free. But the more he runs, of course, the more he realizes he's, he's not free. That's what believers do a lot of times. We want to be free from our experience. And so we run and we run and we run and run. And then that's not working. And so we run more. And the only way to be delivered, the only way that hamster can be delivered is for for his owner to reach down and to pick that hamster out of that cage and set him free. Well, God's given us the keys to coping with prison experiences. And you see, my desire for each of you is that the people at Mountain View will reflect the glory of Christ and learn how to deal with prison experiences so that others will look and say, hey, they're different. They deal with these issues far different than the unbeliever. May God help you to do that. Now, we're going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to close in prayer. And Alan's going to play after I close in prayer. And we're going to invite you, if you're dealing with a prison experience, to come to the altar, to the steps, and to kneel and pray. And I'll try to pray with you. Also, I want to remind you as well that in James chapter 5, it says, If anyone is sick, let him call upon the elders of the church. Let them anoint that person and pray over them. And so, what we we are going to do today is we're going to offer that to you. And by the way, if you look at that text, it seems to me that that's not limited to physical ailments. There may be emotional and other issues that may need prayer for healing. We invite you to come as well. Maybe you just want to come and and, and kneel and pray. Uh, But we want to invite you that freedom to come today. I'll I'll meet you here. I'll pray with you. We'll have some of the elders that will join me, uh, join you if you need others to pray with you. Or if you just want to pray by yourself, that's fine. But we're going to give an invitation as we come to the conclusion of this series, especially as you face your prison experience, to get out and come and kneel before God and, and, and men and say, I need God in my prison experience. Let's pray.